Hare Krishna. So, um, today is a very auspicious day in the ISKCON society. It is the, uh, it's two days that are actually worth glorifying. We'll be doing one of them. And one of the glorifications is that uh, Srila Prabhupada landed in America on September 17th, 1965. So with that, it's an auspicious occasion. And of course, last week we actually did the stiti, and we discussed in detail Prabhupada's coming to America. Today is also the uh, appearance day of His Holiness Bhakti Churu Swami Maharaj. And so um, we all know that Bhakti Churu Maharaj uh, left the planet on July 4th this year, just about two and a half months ago. And so uh, it was a great shock to the entire ISKCON society and at the same time a great loss such a very dear disciple of Srila Prabhupada, a very powerful spiritual personality, uh, a person who opened up many, many projects in ISKCON, including a, a huge temple with full worship in India and in Jain, along with an Ayurvedic hospital translated Srila Prabhupada's books into Bengali. Also uh, uh, created a life video series on Srila Prabhupada called Abhay Charan, which today I learned that by showing this movie Abhay Charan in South India, it started a whole revolution of Prabhupada consciousness and many temples came up just because of that showing. Um, Bhakti Churu Maharaj, is, he's also was a personal servant of Srila Prabhupada for many years. He was a person who received first and second initiation at the same time when he came. And a few months later, sannyas. <laughs> so within three and six months, he got first, second, and sannyas. <laughs> Prabhupada could recognize that here was a very special personality and that he immediately pushed him along to a position of leadership in the society because he knew that he could uh, inspire so many people in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> yeah, he said, um, "Yeah, he's, how is it possible to give such a young person sannyas?" He probably said, "If he falls down, he'll fall down into sattva guna." <laughs> so really, it's not. but that was just to indicate Bhakti Chru Maharaj's spiritual power. Um, yeah, people question Prabhupada's decision. And they vocalized that question, that uh, decision. But Prabhupada stuck, and because he did, he received the results. And Bhakti Chur Maharaj blossomed really quickly in this con and became one of the leaders, and especially in the area of Mayapur. And of course, in other areas around the world, in, in Chicago, in uh, Dilan, where he has started a project there, a farm community. In London, many disciples. In New Taliban, many disciples. In uh, where else? Many places around the world. He visited, he was always traveling around the world. And so um, today we're going to. Uh, I, I mistakenly thought I had a. DVD of just him speaking about Prabhupada, but 
I don't. It's a combination of three devotees who will be alternating their uh, life with Srila Prabhupada. And one of them is Giri Raj Swami. So you'll hear from Giri Raj Swami. And the other person is Jadarani. And Jadarani was one of the first woman disciples of Srila Prabhupada back in 1966. And she was also commissioned by Prabhupada to do many of the paintings that were the original paintings in our society. She is an expert artist. And uh, she, you'll hear from those three, along with those two, along with Bhakti Chu Maharaj, whatever time we have permitted here, so we can uh, begin as soon as... It's two hours. It's two hours, the whole thing. Well, that'll take us a little bit later than we planned, but... <laughs> so you, we can do as much as the devotees can handle. Yeah, we can continue. Tomorrow, I won't be able to give class tomorrow night. But, um, mm -hmm. but it can continue. I can leave the DVD with you and you can continue it. Uh, or next week, yeah. Yeah, the topic of Bhagavad Bhakti Charu Maharaj. Well, I, just sp I just spoke and had other devotees speak online for an hour and a half. We just finished a nice series of glorifications on Maharaj. So we can continue. Uh, yeah, okay, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one you want. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one I was looking for and I couldn't find it. It's on YouTube. Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah, it's only 34 minutes too. It's all, yeah, this is it. You did it. Success. Temple presidents are actually can can actually do something. <laughs> yeah, this is it. I was looking for this. I couldn't find it. I was looking in the wrong place, though. This is beautiful. So he asked Srila Prabhupada in a rather challenging way, why are you make, why are you building new temples when there are so many old temples needing renovation and repair? So Srila Prabhupada didn't answer the question directly. Srila Prabhupada asked that man, who is the lady, who is that lady sitting next to you? So that man says, well, she's going to why? Then Prabhupada asked him, why did you get married? So the man got completely flabbergasted, so he couldn't answer. Then Prabhupada provided the answer. He said, you got married because you wanted to have children. Putra, Tekriya, Tekharta. One gets married, one accepts a wife in order to get children. But why get children when there are so many children loitering in the streets? And then Prabhupada explained that just as you want to have your own child, similarly devotee wants to build his temple and install Krishna and so offer the temple to Krishna. One morning Prabhupada was having his oil massage. Harisavari Prabhu was giving him the massage on the roof of Prabhupada's quarters in Mayapur. I took some letters that I replied, went to Srila Prabhupada, and I used to read the letters out to, the replies out to Srila Prabhupada, and then Prabhupada would used to sign them. Prabhupada signed the letters, and then he uh, continued to take his massage. And although Prabhupada signed the letters, and I should have left, <laughs> but I just sat there, <laughs> and watching Srila Prabhupada having, having his massage. And then Prabhupada just started to speak on his own. I mean, addressing me. He told, many lifetimes you tried to enjoy, but you can see that you're still not satisfied. 
So just offer this life to Krishna. And don't get involved with any woman. And then he explained the futility of man-woman relationship. He explained how uh, that, how sex desire is actually the chain that binds us in the material nature. And that's why the material nature is called Moituna Garden or a prison house of sex desire. And in this note, Srila Prabhupada spoke for about, I don't know for how long, long time, you know, like half an hour, 45 minutes. And when I left, I felt that Prabhupada actually wanted me to take some become a sannyasi, and that's just a feeling. So one morning, Srila Prabhupada wanted some orange juice. So there was no orange in Prabhupada's kitchen, so I went to the deity kitchen, devotee kitchen, there was no orange. So I had to go to the, to the, to the fruit shop, you know, to buy some oranges. And those days, you remember, like, it was quite, there was nothing in front of our temple, so to get get the oranges, I had to go quite a distance, near the bus stop, bus station. And so I came back with the oranges, and I started to make the orange juice, and the bell rang. Sri Prabhupada used to call us by ringing the bell. And so I ran to Sri Prabhupada's room. So Prabhupada asked me what happened to the orange juice. So I say, well, uh, Sri Prabhupada, I'm just getting it, you know. And then I went back and started to make the orange juice. And then, you know, it, take, it took me some time to make it. So the bell rang again. But this time, the bell just kept on ringing continuously, you know. <laughs> Prabhupada just kept pressing the bell, you know. And just by the sound of the bell, I could understand, you know, how angry Sri Prabhupada <laughs> must be. So, I uh, somehow, you know, finished making the orange juice, put it in Prabhupada's silver cup and uh, took it on a silver plate and rushed into Prabhupada's room. But as I opened the door, you know, I heard something that sounded like a thunderbolt. And Prabhupada was just telling me, like, take it away, I don't want it. I don't want it. I'll get out of here. But, you know, I could not get out. <laughs> you know? Like, so with the uh, bowl in my, I mean, with the plate, with the gla glass of orange juice in my hands, I just kept on moving towards Srila Prabhupada. And I came to Srila Prabhupada and I held it in front of him. For some time, Srila Prabhupada didn't pick up the glass. And finally Prabhupada picked it up <laughs> and he started to drink it. When he started to drink it, I remembered, I realized that I forgot to bring the bowl of water that Prabhupada will need to wash his mouth after drinking the juice. So I ran to the kitchen, got the bowl of water. And then when Prabhupada was washing his mouth, then I remembered that I forgot to bring the napkin for Prabhupada to wipe his face. So this time I didn't run to the kitchen, I just went to Prabhupada's wardrobe and pulled out a towel and <clears throat> uh, gave it to Srila Prabhupada. So then Prabhupada started to tell me, you're trying to serve me so nicely, but I always chastise you. You see, when one becomes old, one becomes short-tempered. So please don't do that. When Srila Prabhupada was chastising me, I didn't feel bad. But when Prabhupada started to speak like that, my heart just broke. And I tried to tell Prabhupada, please don't speak like that, Prabhupada. But you know, my voice was choked. And then finally I saw, but Prabhupada continued continuously speaking, you know, like in that note, you know, like how mm, when one becomes old, one becomes short-tempered. And then Prabhupada, I managed to speak up and I told
Lord Robert Robert please don't speak like that I make mistakes and if I if you don't correct me then what will happen to me that's one of the instances I remember when that when Shri Prabhupada chastised me very heavily you see Prabhupada just opened the Gurukul in Vrindavan and opened a build, new building actually the new building was constructed the Vrindavan Gurukul was going on the new building was uh, inaugurated and Srila Prabhupada was very happy with the new building that, and he used to tell people that about the Gurukul building when people came for his darshan so uh, one very important businessman uh, came to see Srila Prabhupada from Delhi. He is uh, Jayadaya Dalmiya, one of the biggest industrialists in India. So he came with his uh, two daughters-in-law and their children. And he was a very old man at the time. And very nice and pious man actually. So Srila Prabhupada was telling him uh, about the Gurukul education system and then he asked him to send his grandchildren to the Gurukul and he explained to him that the modern education system is simply meant for creating sudras how to get a good job and that's the purpose of education but your children, your grandchildren, do not need to get a job. But they should actually become the leader of the society. And that's why he should actually send, he sent his grandchildren to the Gurukul. And Srila Prabhupada also mentioned, see, the Gandhis, uh, Indira Gandhi's sons, Nehru's grandchildren, you know, coming from such an aristocratic family, such a noble family. But look at them, they have become rascals and rogues. And he said, that, Do you want your grandchildren to be like that? No. Uh, train them up to become the leaders of the society, a real leader of the society. And in this way, Srila Prabhupada actually explained. Now later on, <coughs> I uh, got to know his son, the father of one of the grandchild. And he told me that at that time his father was so convinced that he was planning to send his son to uh, the Gurukul. And I, I know the son, his name is Abhishek Dalmiya. Although he didn't go to Gurukul, but he has, you know, he, uh, although he didn't go to the Gurukul, but he keeps a Sikha, you know. I mean, the family is very, the family is very, very uh, uh, pious, you know, like, and it's unfortunate that he didn't send his son to the Gurukul, but, I mean, you can see the potency of Srila Prabhupada's preaching. You know, he is one of the richest men in India, you know, and he was considering to send his grandson to the Guru. This was, you know, uh, just a few days before Prabhupada left the planet. Two very prominent Indian gentlemen came to see Srila Prabhupada. One was the governor of Madras, Sriman Narayan, and his brother-in-law, Ramakrishna Bajaj, a very big industrialist. So two of them came to Prabhupada's room and some of us were there in Prabhupada's room. And at one point they just told that they wanted to discuss something in private with Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada asked us to leave the room. So, you know, we had left the room although we didn't want to <laughs> and but while leaving the room I pressed the button 
recording button on the tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they asked Prabhupada who would actually have the legacy after Prabhupada left the planet. And Prabhupada mentioned to them that he is giving the legacy to all his disciples. And whoever follows will have the legacy. That was, that was actually printed in the Back to Godhead that, was, that came after Prabhupada's disappearance, Prabhupada's final instructions, and this one was there. And then they figured out uh, that the tape recorder was on, and they asked Prabhupada if they could switch off the tape recorder. <laughs> so that was also there you know, in the tape recorder, and it was taped. And I don't think after that they had any serious discussions. Actually what they wanted to know, who would become Prabhupada's successor. But Prabhupada made it very clear that he is giving the legacy to all his disciples, all his followers. So whoever follows has the legacy. And he didn't want to appoint any successor as such. You see, it was in Vrindavan one morning Srila Prabhupada asked me to see if there is uh, uh, spinach, the two varieties of spinach, the green variety and the red variety. Uh, he asked me to see if we have these two varieties of spinach, if there was uh, pumpkin, radish, eggplant and bitter melon. So I went to the kitchen and, you know, there, in Prabhupada's kitchen there was no um, spinach. <coughs> so I went to the dainty kitchen and devotee kitchen, you know. And I was told that that was the month of spinach fast. So I went and told Prabhupada that, Prabhupada, this is Chaturmas and this is the month of spinach fast. So Prabhupada asked me, is everyone observing Chaturmash? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got the message. So I myself went to the market uh, to buy everything. <laughs> and I went to the market and I got, I thought I got everything. Uh, then I came back and I told Prabhupada, Prabhupada I got everything. So Prabhupada asked me what you got. So I said, Prabhupada I got there's two varieties of spinach, I got eggplant, I got pumpkin, I got radish. And then I remembered that I forgot to get bitter melon. But uh, it was so stupid of me, you know, like I, I told Prabhupada, I lied to Prabhupada, this is bitter melon. <laughs> so I thought, you know, just arrange to get the bitter melon, you know. So, <clears throat> Prabhupada said, bring them. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> I ran up, so Prabhupada asked me to bring it. So I ran out and there was an employee in the kitchen, in the guest house. His name was Kishan. So I told, I gave some money to Kishan and I said, Kishan, take the cycle, go to the market and get some bitter melon. And so I was, you know, I thought it would take 10, 15 minutes, you know. And in the meantime, I went to the kitchen, I started to prepare other preps. And, and I was kind of, you know, running back to the gate and kitchen and back, you know. And then uh, finally Kishan came back and he said that there is no bitter melon in the market. <laughs> and so I already went to the kitchen, the devotee kitchen, there was no bitter milk. And at that time, you know, I felt as if, you know, I mean, the whole world is crumbled down on me, you know. And I was uh, literally praying to Krishna, you know, like, please save me. So now I have to go and tell Prabhupada that I lied to him, you know, that I forgot to bring bitter milk. And 
you know, like I was kind of dazed and walking back. I was kind of preparing myself. Now I have to go and tell Prabhupada. I didn't tell him at that time because I thought that Prabhupada would get annoyed with me and start chastising. And now, who knows, you know, what kind of chastisement I'll get. And <clears throat> so, usually what I used to do is take the passage uh, next to the temple, uh, the Parikrama Marg, and walk up to the uh, up to Prabhupada's kitchen. But I don't know, I was so dazed. I took, I walked up to the Gurukul building and then I started to, you know, go that way through the Gurukul building. And there, you know, I saw on the balcony, on that passage, the Gurukul, there is one green bitter <laughs> I, you know, I just pounced on that and started to thank Krishna in every possible way and ran, <laughs> picked up the vegetables and went to Prabhupada's room and I, Prabhupada was already taking his massage. Before taking his bath, he used to take his massage. So I went to his room and I told Prabhupada I brought the vegetables. So Prabhupada asked me, told me how to cut the vegetables. And then finally I said, Prabhupada and the bitter melon. And so Prabhupada looked at me and said, bitter melon. <laughs> and just the way Shri Prabhupada said bitter melon, I had, I was completely convinced beyond any doubt that Prabhupada knew what actually happened. <laughs> Prabhupada taught me to cook one preparation called Bhati Chachari. Uh, it is made with potter and potatoes. And you put a lot of ghee and a lot of chili, a lot of red chili. And so Prabhupada asked me to cook that preparation. And but Prabhupada was, Prabhupada's stomach was not very good at that time. So while preparing that, you know, I felt that I should not put so much red chili. So I cooked it, you know, with, no, he had stomach problem. I mean, his stomach was not so good. So he didn't want any uh, uh, red chili. And <laughs> Uh, he didn't want any red chili in there. I mean, I didn't put any red chili, you know, thinking that, you know, like his stomach was not good. And when I served, you know, Prabhupada just took a bite and he became very angry. He said that, I personally taught you how to cook it and you forgot. And <laughs> he was very, very heavy. And not only at that time, for next two days, uh, whenever I went near him, you know, he just blasted me. <laughs> that I per and his point was, he personally taught me how to cook that, and I forgot. And not only he chastised me, whoever went to him, he also told him <laughs> how useless I was. <laughs> Then on the third day, when uh, Prabhupada's anger, I mean Prabhupada's anger subsided to some extent. <laughs> and Prabhupada kind of in rather a mild way this time, he asked me, uh, how could you forget when I personally taught you? And then I told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I didn't actually forget. I deliberately didn't put it because your stom I thought your stomach was not good and red chili will not be good for your condition. Then Prabhupada told me, then why didn't you tell me all this, wife? <laughs> and then he told me that ghee is hot and chili is hot. But when there is a lot of ghee and a lot of chili, they counteract each other. <laughs> but what <clears throat> 
uh, touched my heart the most, if I can say so, was Prabhupada's concern for everyone. In one hand, Prabhupada was so strict, but at the same time, Prabhupada was so compassionate and so concerned. Like I remember, Prabhupada for months, for two months at least, he did not eat anything. Only once in a while he would take some juice, fruit juice, and a little diluted milk. But he would uh, inquire how the devotees were eating, and how the devotee prasad was. So one day Prabhupada asked me to go and check out how the devotee prasad was. And I came back and told that the prasad was not so nice. When Prabhupada called the temple president and he chastised him, he asked why the prasad was not nice. See, he himself couldn't eat anything for two months, but he was so concerned about how uh, the devotees were eating. See, I was with Srila Prabhupada, and we were living in Srila Prabhupada's quarters on the sixth floor of the tower. And one of my senior god brothers one day was a little annoyed with me. And he started to chastise me very heavily. And those days I used to be quite sensitive. You know, I was feeling really bad that he chastised me. Then <clears throat> I went to Srila Prabhupada on some, I had to do something. So when I went to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada just on his own, he just started to tell me, you see, the sign of one's advancement, the sign of one's spiritual advancement is not in the big position one has. The real sign of advancement is hum how humble and how tolerant one is. And just that instruction, you know, like took away all the, you know, the heaviness from the heart. And I just remember. And that, that instruction I often remember, that the sign of our advancement is not in our position, but in how humble and how tolerant we have become. When Prabhupada first went to Mayapur with his American disciple. They bought a piece of land in Mayapur and so they, Prabhupada actually drove straight to Mayapur, our <coughs> place. It was just a small hut that they built for Srila Prabhupada without stopping at Gauriya Mount, Chaitanya Mount and Bhakti Siddhanta Sharshi Thakur Samadhi. <coughs> so some of his god brothers commented that he didn't even stop at his spiritual master's samadhi. So, when Prabhupada heard about that, when Prabhupada was told that they were speaking like that, then Prabhupada commented, do they think that I am ever separated from my spiritual master even for a moment? My spiritual master is always with me. And, and that is how a disciple should always be conscious of his spiritual master. Like spiritual master is non, none other than the super soul. The spiritual master is the super soul or actually even more than the super soul. The yogis, when they attain perfection, they see the super soul in the heart. A devotee, when he attains perfection, he sees his spiritual master in the heart. So pure devotion means to see his spiritual master in his heart all the time. So more we become uh, Krishna conscious, more we make spiritual advancement, the more we will see Srila Prabhupada in our hearts. And <clears throat> We are seeing, like, actually that's the benefit of being in Islam. Like, everywhere we see Srila Prabhupada. 
Prabhupada's temples, Prabhupada's deities, Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada's devotees, you know, everything is Srila Prabhupada. And that's what is actually uh, not only protecting us from the onslaughts of Maya, uh, but automatically pushing us uh, towards our ultimate destination, Krishna's lotus feet. Once I expressed my desire to learn Sanskrit to Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada uh, uh, asked me, why? What's the use? Yeah, that's how what he said. What's the use? So I started to exp tell Prabhupada, you know, like giving him different reasons. And Prabhupada started to, you know, <laughs> smash all those reasons. And then finally he made the point that our business is not to become a Sanskrit scholar. There are so many Sanskrit scholars, but what are they doing? Our main business is to preach Krishna consciousness all over the world. And, and you know, with whatever ability, with whatever qualification we have, And then uh, I started to tell him what, that, what actually happened. That I told him about Bhima's Mahaprasthan. Prabhupada heard about that. And right after that, Prabhupada was planning uh, to go for a Parikrama of Govardhan. And I feel Prabhupada is actually planning to go on a Mahaprasthan himself. You know, the, the final departure. And uh, then Bhavali Maharaj said, then we can't let him. Then I said, Prabhupada, Maharaj, the only person who can convince Prabhupada not to go is you. So Bhavali Maharaj was so humble, you know, he said, me? How can I tell him? <laughs> so I said, you are the only person who can actually convince him. So then Bhavali Maharaj, you know, like, he just got up, washed his hands and mouth, and walked straight up to Srila Prabhupada and said, I heard everything and I feel that you should not go to Parikrama. Then Prabhupada said, Babaji Maharaj, if you say so, then I will not go. And at that time, you know, like, we kind of took it for granted that Srila Prabhupada was, Prabhupada came to Vrindavan to leave his body. You know? And so around that time, you know, uh, Tamakrishna Maharaj one day, he told me, that uh, we don't really know uh, if what to do if Prabhupada leaves his body, if Prabhupada left his body. You know, I didn't know. We didn't know what to do. So he asked me to find out from Krishna's Bhavadi Maharaj. And so, you know, I went one afternoon, late afternoon, I went to Madhav Maharaj's Mat, where Krishna's Bhavadi Maharaj was staying. So <clears throat> I went but uh, Babaji Maharaj was not there. So I was waiting for him for a while, he just came back. So when I came back, Upendra Prabhu, who was Prabhupada's servant at that time, told me that Prabhupada was looking for me. So I ran into Prabhupada's room and asked him whether he wanted me to do anything. So Prabhupada asked, uh, where did you go? Where were you? So I said, Prabhupada, I went to Madhav Maharaj's mat. So Prabhupada asked, uh, why did you go there? I mean, there was, his voice was ringing with anger, you know, like, he said, why did you go there? And I couldn't answer, you know, why I went there, you know, like, I mean, it was, you know, how could I say why I went there? And I was just silent, you know, and then Prabhupada's voice kept on, you know, rising. And he was screaming, you know, like, why did you go there? So finally I said, Prabhupada, I went to see Krishna Babaji Maharaj. And then Prabhupada's voice became even uh, louder with anger. And he asked, why did you go there? So I finally said, Prabhupada, Tamar Krishna Maharaj wanted. Oh, I see. So he became quiet. 
From that, you know, I learned a lesson that Prabhupada didn't want us to go, go out to anybody. Although he had such a good relationship with Baba Ji Maharaj, still he didn't want us to go to him. And that actually, you know, I mean, it makes it later on I got to know, like, how Prabhupada said that if they say one thing different from me, then everything will be spoiled. And that's why Prabhupada didn't want us to go anywhere. He was like a caring father, you know, who was just protecting us from any danger. <laughs> That was just a little brief introduction to the sweet and loving relationship that Maharaj had with Srila Prabhupada. That's one of many stories and incidents in his life. Sometimes you might think when you're listening to that, why was Prabhupada so heavy with him? <laughs> and when somebody cares about you and knows how to care about you, it's different than somebody who just is your well-wisher. They're still your well-wisher, but they act in such a way as to make sure that you grow in the way that will be beneficial for yourself and for others. So Prabhupada was actually really training Bhakti Charu Maharaj in such a way that he could be exemplary in his Krishna consciousness. Some of us who maybe would find ourselves in similar positions, we'd probably break because we couldn't take such heavy you know, chastisements or corrections. But one who has uh, knowledge and one who has a relationship with Krishna through the spiritual master considers praise to be the worst thing and chastisement to be the best. Why? Because one can grow. <laughs> one doesn't grow so much from praise. But one can grow when one gets corrected because something that is there within one is no longer there. And that correction is actually love. It's actually mercy. So that's why Bhakti Trumar, when he's narrating his relationship with Prabhupada, he's actually speaking about it in a, such a loving way that Yes, he chastised me. I made so many mistakes, but I consider that my, my fondest of all memories. <laughs> now that's that's 
that's one who really wants to become ideal in the relationship with the, with Krishna and the spiritual master. They want to be corrected. They want to be what we say, uh, told that this is wrong and this is right. And sometimes it has to be done in a strong way in order to get the point across. So, uh, and that shows a great disciple. That's where Bhakti Charu Maharaj was exemplary in his relationship with Srila Prabhupada. There were many loving moments too, like when uh, the devotees were moving from one place to another. I think we're going to pray. Prabhupada was going from Mayapur, no, he was going from Calcutta to Rindavan. And uh, some devotees were chosen to come, and Bhakti Chiru Maharaj was there. And the devotees who were senior, Sajai suggested that Bhakti Chiru Maharaj stay back and do the work that was needed in Calcutta. But when Prabhupada heard about that, he said no. He should come. <laughs> I want him to cook for me. <laughs> he, he loved, you know, Prabhupada, you know, you might look at it from a material way because, you know, Bhakti True Maharaj was Bengali and Prabhupada was Bengali. <laughs> but there was, uh, that means there was something there in the culture, but still, it was more than that, <laughs> much more than that. And there was that special relationship that when someone loves you, you, you want to be around them. <laughs> it's just natural. And Bhakti Chiru Maharaj had such love for Prabhupada that Prabhupada could feel it. And therefore Prabhupada took special care to make sure that, that they were together as much as it could be. And at the same time, he would get the chance to grow in Krishna consciousness. So that was that was that sweet loving relationship. I often speak about this, and I like to speak about this. Is that I had the good fortune of being with Bhakti Chu Maharaj during his Vyas Puja programs, and of course that's the time when the spiritual master is honored by the disciples, and there are many much eulogies and much gifts given. So. When that started to happen with Bhakti Chiru Maharaj, I noticed that in order to satisfy the disciples, he allowed them to speak. But every time they would speak about him, he would glorify Srila Prabhupada. Whatever they said about him that was glorious or something loving, he would take it and just glorify Srila Prabhupada. And that was like that all the time. He, he, he would always find reasons to glorify Srila Prabhupada. And then what happened afterwards is that his uh, Vyas Puja programs were no longer about him anymore. It was just Prabhupada. <laughs> he got to the point where we're thinking, we should just glorify Prabhupada, that's all. Because if we glorify Prabhupada, everyone will benefit. <laughs> and and Krishna will be pleased also. <laughs> so uh, I saw that, that he turned his uh, own Vyasa Puja programs into programs of glorifications of Srila Prabhupada. I just heard something today that was really, really touching to my heart, maybe because it was a person that I'm kind of close with, He's a, a husband of one of my disciples. He's also a disciple of Satchinandana Maharaj. And so uh, we were talking today about Bhakti Charu Maharaj. And he was telling a, a personal story. He said, uh, you know, when I first got introduced to Krishna consciousness, I didn't know so much. And so I was just going to the temple, but I wasn't getting so inspired by going to the temple. I was thinking, and the people I were meeting, and I didn't find much inspiration to really move forward in my Krishna consciousness. It was just, I felt like 
you know, there's something here, but I don't really taste it. It must be so. So um, I was thinking what to do. So I met this one senior devotee and I asked him, you know, I like to really go deeper into this Krishna consciousness. I don't feel it, but I know there's more. What should I do? He said, try and meet Bhakti Churu Maharaj. <laughs> so he thought about it. And then he just, he, he was telling us that in Washington, D.C., there was a program, and uh, Bhakti Churu Maharaj had been the guest. But the special guest for the program was Radhanaswami. So the program was given by Radhanaswami, and Bhakti Churu Maharaj sat in the audience. <laughs> Jai Sisi Panchitatva Ki Jai. And uh, so Radhana Swami was giving the class. But then Radhana Swami, after he spoke his class, he turned and started to glorify. Bhakti Churu Maharaj, who was sitting in the class. And then he turned to Bhakti Churu Maharaj and said, Maharaj, please speak something. So Maharaj got up, took the seat, and he spoke. All he did was glorify Radha Swami. <laughs> he just kept glorifying Radha It was his whole class. <laughs> he just glorified Radha Swami. <laughs> and so this devotee who came to see Bhakti Churu Maharaj, he's there. And he's listening. And then after, he wanted to meet Bhakti Churu Maharaj, and Bhakti Churu Maharaj was there. And so he walked up to Bhakti Churu Maharaj, immediately paid his obeisances. And uh, when he got up, Bhakti Churu Maharaj picked him up and embraced him. He never met him before. <laughs> and gave him a big hug. <laughs> and he said, my whole life just changed in that one second when he embraced me. <laughs> I felt, I felt, like I felt fully Krishna conscious. <laughs> and then there was just a sweet exchange of words because they didn't know each other. And then that was it. But he said that was a turning point in his life. When that happened, his whole Krishna consciousness was like now he was fixed and. He got fully involved in Krishna consciousness just by getting the embrace of Bhakti Chu Maharaj. And when you speak to devotees, especially us, his god brothers, we find that this was the thing that really was outstanding in Bhakti Chu Maharaj was he was so personal and so caring and so loving. And this was true. Anytime he would see his god brothers, he would immediately embrace him. It wasn't about paying obeisances. <laughs> he would embrace him. I must have got hundreds of embraces. <laughs> Every time I saw him, he would always embrace me. And so he would always look at me and say, he would ask me, how's Radha Swami? <laughs> he would always ask me that. And I would say, well, I think he's okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, because he, he had a special relationship with Radha Swami that was really deep and sweet. That was really something very, very special. And so, uh, and you could, you could, you could speak to any of the Prabhupada disciples, and every time they would meet Maharaj, he would give them a big hug and ask him, "How are you? When did you come?" <laughs> He was always so like sweet and loving, personal like that, and that and it wasn't like, you know, sometimes people are like that because it's good business, or they do it because they want you to feel good. He did it because it was naturally coming from his heart. It wasn't something that was artificial or just put on as a, as a. Uh, as a, a way to greet people, he was actually really genuinely showing his love for his godbrothers. He had such, and not only for his godbrothers, 
he was, of course, he wouldn't embrace people in general. But for people in general, devotees that he met, or people in general, he was so personal. When he would see one lady, he would meet them. He, oh, how are you? How is the family? How is everything? How are the children? And he'd always take a personal interest in their life, just to, you know, he was he was like that. He was just concerned about everyone on a personal level. And that's what devotees remember him more than anything of all his amazing qualities is that he was so personal and so caring with everyone. But yet, you know, when it came to preaching Krishna consciousness, he, he, could, he would, amazingly, the way he presented Krishna consciousness. One time I was in Bhaktivedanta Manor, and it was John Mastami. And he was there, and I had given a short talk, and then he spoke after me. And uh, he spoke a little bit about Krishna's pastimes, and then all of a sudden he just changed and just went deep into Krishna's pastimes. And I'm sitting there listening, and I'm thinking, my God, I never heard of Krishna Leela like this before. It was so absorbing. And I was just thinking, wow, he must have a special relationship with Krishna. Because <laughs> no one could speak so sweetly and so, uh, what we say, intimately about Krishna. It was just so nice. He wouldn't do that a lot, but on this John Mastami, and there was a lot of devotees there, this was in, in London, uh, he just opened up his heart and started speaking Krishna Leela with such devotion. It was just amazing. Yeah. Another thing I would like to mention, of course, is I won't speak too long. I mean, I could speak about my experiences with him for a long time. I was fortunate. I had a lot of a lot of association, and I consider that Krishna's mercy upon me. But one thing that was just recently related to me about Bhakti Charu Maharaj was that we all know just about a couple of years ago there was a big fight in New York over the New York temple. There was a big... Some devotees decided to sell the New York temple and had already got a big bid of sixty million dollars. Sixty million dollars to buy that temple. So they were going to head with the sale. But then they didn't tell anybody, they did it privately. But when it got back to the GBC, the temple was going to be sold, the GBC intervened and started a big discussion and it was decided not to sell the temple. And so there was two lines drawn between two groups of devotees. One group wanted to sell the temple, the other group representing Srila Prabhupada and the GBC said, no, we can't sell, this is a very important temple. It's been here for many years. <clears throat> and because Prabhupada said, don't sell temples. He said, sell books, but don't sell temples. <laughs> and so there was a big fight. I mean, it got into a huge legal battle. And it got pretty heated, too. There was a lot of, you know, hot words exchanged between devotees. So finally, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj at one point came in and addressed the, the assembly of both sides of the devotees at the New York Temple. And he spoke really powerfully and strongly, explaining from Srila Prabhupada's desire and from the position of the GBC, and the position of the importance of keeping the temple. And he was like a different person. Usually when he would speak, he would speak so lovingly. He was like a lion. And during that talk, people were, who were against Bhakti Trumars, who wanted to sell the temple, were yelling at him during the talk. It didn't faze him a bit. He kept his talk going. He didn't even respond to their outcries. and just kept going. And it said that after that talk, things changed. 
and the devotees gained a lot more power and then eventually we won the case of course and the temple was kept <laughs> and so and all credit went to Bhakti Charu Maharaj because he made a big difference by when he intervened and spoke on behalf of the Srila Prabhupada and the Governing Body Commission so that was problem. That was Bhakti Trumad. He could be heavy. He could be heavy, but he was always loving. <laughs> if someone loves you, really loves you, they don't just let you do whatever they you want to do because they think it's love. They tell you when you're off. That's real love. A person who always tells you how good you are. And, be careful, because <laughs> that means they want something. <laughs> so, of course, we, we should be in the position, or we should, we have a relationship with a pro, with a person, and based on that relationship, we can speak honestly. And that was Bhakti Sri Maharaj. He could immediately have a relationship with you just by meeting you. It wasn't like he had to be introduced or a relationship had to develop, he could have that relationship with you just by being, just by meeting with you. He could be, he, you could feel that this person cares, this person is, you know, he's a person that I could relate to, because he could relate to everybody, even children. <laughs> he was very good with children too. So these are some thoughts, and this, of course, it's a it's a wonderful day in the sense that we have a chance to honor Maharaj again. Of course, it's sad; and it's a great loss for our society. It's a loss we may not recover from, but ultimately, Krishna has his plans. And when he takes someone away, he does it for a reason. And the reason is always beneficial for everyone in the long run. So, but um, I, I was thinking maybe Bhakti Charu Maharaj was really feeling the separation of Srila Prabhupada. And so Krishna g gave him that association again. So I'll just end here. So thank you for coming tonight and being a part of this chance to hear about, hear from Bhakti Chiru Maharaj. And uh, we shouldn't allow time to make things forgetful. Time shouldn't cause us to forget. It has a tendency to do that. As time goes on, we, we, we kind of forget things. But certain things we should never forget. <laughs> And that's the people who gave us so much in our Krishna consciousness that they stay with us through our whole life. And we always remember them in a, one, in a way that we can appreciate that when they were here, we gained so much. <laughs> and that's true. That's actually true. So, uh, thank you. So we'll end here. Shila Bhakti Chiru Maharaj Ki Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Hare Krishna